we're now going to look at some consequences of the strong Markov property. We'll use the same setup that we used in the last three lectures. Our process will be a time homogeneous Markov process in a separable metric space as its state space, whose paths are assumed to be continuous or at least right continuous. And we'll make this technical assumption on the regularity of the Markov transition semigroup. We know that all of the processes that we've studied so far in this year long course have this property, Brownian motion, bounded rate continuous time Markov chains, like for example, Poisson process. All of these are so-called strong Markov processes. That is because of these properties, they have the strong Markov property. That is to say, even if we stop the process at a random time that is optional for the filtration that we're adapted to, the process still restarts there from whatever state that it got to at that time. Now, for simplicity and definiteness, we're going to work largely with the natural filtration for the process in the next lecture or two. That is, FT will always denote the minimal sigma field generated by the process up to time t. And let's introduce some notation here. Theta t is the Markov shift operator. It's a function on path space. And what it does to a path is to shift it forward t time units. So we can restate the strong Markov property sort of in terms of this theta t. Let's actually state it in the much simpler case where the optional time is actually a fixed time t. We'll see that the strong Markov property we proved is actually a little bit stronger than the regular Markov property even in that case. Because the left hand side of the strong Markov property we proved can be written like this. This is the same thing as the conditional expectation of f at x t plus dot given f t plus. It's convenient to think of this as a shift of the function involved still applied to the process x. And what the strong Markov property tells us is that this is the same as taking the regular expectation of f at x not shifted but started in state x, where this function of x is then evaluated at the random point xt. Now let's look at something curious here. With a fixed time t here, we've used the fact that it's optional in order to condition on the augmented filtration, but the fixed time t is also a stopping time, so we can use the slightly weaker version of the strong Markov property to note that this is also what we get if we condition the shifted process just on ft. In other words, we get the following property for the shift. Conditioning any shifted by t function of our process on the augmented sigma field at time t is the same as conditioning that shifted process by the sigma field ft. Well, it turns out that functions of the process of this form generate all functions of the process. And so that leads to the following curious lemma. If z is any bounded f infinity measurable function on our probability space, then for any fixed non-negative time, conditioning z on ft plus is the same as conditioning z on ft almost surely. Again, to be clear, this is a statement precisely about the natural sigma field generated by the process itself. In many sources, you'll find this statement made specifically about the canonical path space realization of our process, where the process is just xt of omega is omega of t, that is, it's the projection map, and we're realizing it by its law on that space. But we can state it in this abstract form just as easily. Let's prove this now. First, Following our statement from the last slide, suppose that z has this form where it is some y that is ft measurable times a function of x shifted by t specifically. Well, in that case, following more or less the same argument we had on the last slide, we will get this statement holding. Let's just go through the details. First, note that ft is, of course, contained in ft plus and y is assumed to be ft measurable, which means that by the product rule, we can pull y out of this conditional expectation.
Now we apply the strong Markov property because t is an optional time, always. But a fixed time t is also always a stopping time. And so using the strong Markov property again, sort of in reverse here, we get that this expectation can be written as the conditional expectation of the shifted function of x given just ft. And now finally, we'll note once again that y is ft measurable. And so by the product rule, we can put the y back in. But this is z, and so we've proved the statement that we wanted for z is of that special form. Now we wanted to prove this statement for all bounded functions that are f infinity measurable. How do we get from functions of this special form to that? Well, we'll use Dinkin's multiplicative systems theorem once again, which by now you should have figured out is probably the most important workhorse theorem in this course. Let's denote, to be careful about which time we're using, mt to be the set of all functions of this form. And I claim that this is a multiplicative system, which is easy to check. If I take two functions of this form, y1 times f1 shifted by t applied to x times y2 times f2 shifted by t applied to x well, of course, using commutativity of multiplication of these real-valued functions, I can combine the y's. And given the definition of composition of functions and multiplication of functions point-wise, this is the same thing as f1 times f2 composed with theta t at x. And since both the bounded ft measurable functions and the bounded cylinder measurable functions on path space are multiplicative systems. These two are back where they need to be, and so this is indeed a multiplicative system. Now we've shown that this property we're interested in holds for this multiplicative system, and we'd like to show that it holds here. So of course we're going to define h to be the set of all functions in here for which this holds and hope to show that it's actually all of them using Dinkin's theorem. So h will denote the set of all bounded f infinity measurable functions with the property that this curious conditioning restriction applies. This space clearly contains the identity function one since we just get the constant one on both sides here. It's also a linear subspace of here due to the fact that conditional expectation is linear. And it is also closed under bounded convergence using standard arguments, although you may want to be careful and use the conditional dominated convergence theorem here. We showed on the last slide that our multiplicative system MT is contained in H, and therefore by Dinkin's multiplicative systems theorem, the space of all bounded functions that are sigma of MT measurable is contained in H. So to conclude the proof of the theorem, we just need to show that f infinity is contained in that sigma field. Well, let's think back to our proof of the strong Markov property, where we considered functions of this form. We had a multiplicative system m tilde, not of functions on omega, but of functions on path space that had this cylindrical form. There were functions of a path defined by a finite number of times and a finite collection of functions on the path space that were in that multiplicative system M that we assumed is at the core of our Markov transition semigroup. Well, if we take any one of those functions, let's call it G, and we now evaluate it not at an arbitrary path, but at a path of our process, that is, we take G of X, which means just this here, I've decided to break this up at some J because for the sake of the proof, we're going to suppose that the t that we're interested in falls in between tj minus 1 and tj. Of course, t might not be anywhere in between these t's. 
T might be way ahead of all of them, or it might be before all of them as well. Those will just be special cases of considering this case. We know T will be somewhere either before all of them, after all of them, or in between two of them uniquely, because these form a partition of the whole positive real line if you include the large infinite partition piece after TK. Well, it's convenient to write it in this product form because these terms here, this function, is actually FT measurable. because all of these times are less than or equal to t. So this is manifestly a function of the process before time t. And as for these terms over here that are after t, we can write that as some function shifted by time t of our process, where we take that function of a path omega to be the product of those functions of the path at the times shifted back, which is legal because all of those times are greater than t. So what that shows is that for any function g in that multiplicative system, g at our process x is actually in this new multiplicative system, mt. Now, last time we showed that the sigma field generated by this multiplicative system here was all cylinder sets. That is, the sigma field generated by all of the projections. I'll leave it to you to check that therefore f infinity, which is of course the sigma field generated by all of the xs's for s greater than or equal to zero, is contained in the set of all functions in there composed with x, which we've just seen is contained in sigma of mt. And that proves this result. By the way, if you don't like this level of abstraction here, which is the reason that many authors choose to work only on the canonical path space realization of the process so that this is equal to this, you can simply go through the exact same argument we went through in the last lecture and define a new m tilde to be this instead of this, and use the arguments that we used last time to show that that sigma field generates all of f infinity. So what does this funny result tell us? It says that in wide generality, conditioning on ft plus is the same as conditioning on ft, which as you can quickly work out, says that ft and ft plus are more or less the same. They can only differ by null sets. Now that might seem like a boring statement, but it actually has some profound and surprising consequences. And here is the main one, Blumenthal's zero one law, which says the following. If FT is the natural filtration of a strong Markov process, that is one with the conditions that we're working with, like Brownian motion or any bounded rate continuous time Markov chain, then if I look at F zero plus, that is, the augmented sigma field from the starting time, that is a trivial sigma field. Meaning that for any event E in that augmented sigma field, its probability is either zero or one, no matter what the initial state of our process is. Now the fact that F zero is trivial is trivial, given that the process under this measure is almost surely constant at time zero. And we can use the result we just proved about conditioning on FT plus being the same as conditioning on FT to therefore extend that triviality to the augmented sigma field. Here's how. We can just take the random variable Z to be the indicator function of our event A in F0 plus. Since F0 plus is of course contained in F infinity, the last result tells us that if we condition that random variable on F0 plus, that's the same as conditioning it on F0. Now, A is an F0 plus measurable event, and therefore this conditioning doesn't do anything. That's just the indicator function we started with. But what can we say about this? This is, of course, an F0 measurable function. And since F0 is the sigma field generated by just X0, by the dube dinkin representation, it follows that this random variable is some function of X0. That function will be on the state space and of course will be bounded since 
this function is bounded. But under this probability measure, x0 is almost surely equal to x. And so what that says is that the indicator function of a is equal to f at x, almost surely with respect to that probability measure, px. Now we can derive two things from that back and forth. If we look forward and note that, hey, the indicator function of a is a 0, 1 valued function, it therefore follows that this number here, this is just a constant, it's not a random variable, this is equal to 0 or equal to 1. One of those two things must hold. But then going backwards, we can say, oh, but then the probability of a, which is the expected value of the indicator of a, is the expected value of this constant function, because these two are equal almost surely with respect to that probability measure. And that function is equal to either 0 or 1. And so this is equal to 0 or 1, which is what we wanted to show. So that might seem like all it says is that augmenting didn't do anything after all. We're still in this sort of trivial case where we have no information, except that there are profound consequences to this because events involving limits or limits or limb soups of the Brownian paths as I approach zero from above, those are all gonna be F zero plus measurable. And this triviality is going to tell us very surprising and interesting things about those paths.